I tell you, God loves us more than any of us realize. I believe that, to, that tonight and this weekend, God's going to help us to understand a little bit more about how much He loves us. Let's turn over to Genesis chapter 3, and I just want to use this verse to kind of get started. This weekend, I want to talk about what God is really like. If you don't understand the true nature of God, you're going to relate to Him incorrectly. And of course, Satan is a master at discrediting God and saying things about Him that are untrue. Right here in Genesis, you can see this, that Satan came to Adam and Eve, and in Genesis 3, 1, he said, Hath God said, he began to challenge what God had said, that ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said, Well, he said we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said we cannot touch it or eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. And the serpent said, verse 4, Unto the woman, you shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You know, some people haven't thought about this, but the, but the devil didn't really challenge what God said in the sense that, uh, you know, he didn't say, well, that isn't true, but he challenged why he said it. God said this to keep you from eating of the fruit of the tree because he doesn't want you to be like him. Did you know that that was a total misrepresentation of God? The reason the Lord told Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit was because he want, didn't want them to experience all of the condemnation, the guilt, the shame, the problems that this would bring into the human race. It is true that God said don't eat of the tree, but they misunderstood why he said it. And the same thing is true with us today, and that is that we have misunderstood a number of things that God has said. And because of it, Satan plays off of this, and this is why many people aren't receiving from God is because they just have misunderstood God. And you know, there's a lot of things. It's hard for finite people to understand infinite God, so we're already at a disadvantage. But, and I'm going to say something right here that's going to shock some of you. Don't leave until you give me time to explain it. <laughs> but did you know that religion is probably the number one source of misinformation about God? If you were to just take the average person off of the street and introduce them to God, they'd be much better off than if they'd have come through religion. Right. Now, the scripture says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, that traditions and doctrines of men have made the word of God of none effect. And you know, it's now been 2,000 years since Jesus came, and over 2,000 years, there's just been little things inserted here and there. I don't know why all of this has happened. I'll give people the benefit of the doubt and maybe they were sincere and meant well. You know, for a long period of time, they didn't have copies of the scripture as such written in the common language and people couldn't know it and they just had to trust a few people to interpret it for them. But whatever the reasons are, we have gotten a long ways off from what the Bible truly represents God as. And there are, there's misinformation about him. And here's another really startling statement. Most of this misinformation comes from the Bible. Not that there's anything wrong with the Bible, but people have misunderstood it. Primarily, one of the things I'm going to be focusing on this weekend is that they've misunderstood the Old Covenant and what the Old Covenant was given for. And they have used it and they have painted a picture of God that is a harsh, mean, angry God, a stern God, that if you don't do everything right, God is displeased and all of these things. And much of this comes from the Bible. There are examples of God hitting people with leprosy and striking them and things happening in the Bible. And because it wasn't understood properly, it's misrepresented God, and I believe that the average Christian today has a total wrong concept of the very heart and nature of God. And when you compare this with other scriptures like Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, where it says, faith works by love. 
If faith works by love, and if we don't understand that God is love, if we've had that tainted, and we see God as a mean, stern, angry God who's giving you what you deserve and things like that, well, then that means that your faith's not going to work because faith works by love. We've got to properly understand God. And my personal testimony is that when I got a revelation of God's love for me, I mean, my life just transformed. Nobody, you know, this was before I heard of Copenhagen, Copeland and Hagen. I'd never heard of them. I didn't know that those people existed. But I got a revelation of God's love for me, and instantly I started believing for miracles. I, start, I, I knew that God was so awesome and so good that he would want to help people and to touch them and see bodies healed and finances come. And I started believing for miracles before I knew that there was another person in the last 2,000 years that had believed for miracles. My faith just immediately started working because of a revelation of God's love. And I believe that this is the very thing that keeps many people from walking in the blessings of God is because we've got misunderstanding about the very nature of God. Let me give you a little illustration and then I'm going to get into some scriptures and begin to start showing this to you. But I had, I've had horses most of my life and I had this one couple that gave me two horses, Red and Riff were their names. And anyway, I, they were Arabian horses and I rode these horses all the time. And then two or three years later, they gave me the foals that came from those horses and, that, and one of them was named El Shaddai and the other one was named Shadow. And anyway, these were wild horses that these people had just gotten to where they got so busy they didn't have time for them. And they had these, uh, these horses from foals and they just turned them out in the pasture and nobody had touched them in nearly three years. They were totally wild and they ran in about 50 acre pasture or something like that. And one of them had had a halter put on it when it was a yearling. And so that thing had grown to where it was nearly three years old and the halter was beginning to cut into the muzzle on this Arabian horse and mess it up. And anyway, they were getting ready to move and they just said, if you want those horses, go get them and I'll give them to you. So man, I wanted them. So I went out there and tried to catch them and they were wild. You couldn't come close to them. I paid two cowboys $350 a piece to catch those horses and to break them for me. And anyway, over two weekends, they went out and... They wound up, both of those guys, going to the hospital. Nobody could catch those horses. And these people were moving the next weekend, and if they couldn't catch them, they were just going to call the Humane Society and have them shot and give them to the Humane Society, uh, tranquilized and give them to the Humane Society. And they, that's so anyway, there went my two horses. So I was praying about this and saying, God, there's got to be a way to get these horses. And it's a long story. I won't go into the whole thing. But the Lord taught me, showed me how to catch those horses. And so I caught, I caught this when El Shaddai was the, was the wildest one. Isn't that something? A name of God, El Shaddai. And uh, that was the wildest one. And anyway, I caught this horse. Jamie was with me. And I had sunk a railroad tie in the center of this pasture. And they would eat out of a bucket or something, but they wouldn't let you touch them. So what I did, I got this really stiff nylon rope, put it around this bucket, put feed in it, put grass over the rope so that the horses couldn't see it. And I stood about from here to the front row away from that bucket. And when that horse got up there, I just flipped that rope over and uh, caught it around the neck. And it was a slip knot. So anyway, I caught that uh, horse and it, it scared the fire out of this horse. And this horse took off at a dead run just as fast as it could go. And it reached the end of that rope and that rope caught and flipped it over on its back, all four feet up in the air. Now let me say something before I finish this story. Those of you that are horse lovers, uh, don't get mad at me. I didn't know what was gonna happen. <laughs> I was trying to save this horse's life. They were going to put it down. It was a matter of life and death. And uh, I tried another alternative and it didn't work. So anyway, this was just what I did. And when that happened, that horse, El Shaddai, became demon-possessed. <laughs> and this horse started pitching and bucking and running. And it was running in a circle around this thing. And I mean... Its eyes were wide. It was shooting things, stuff out its back. It was uh, spitting stuff out its front. 
And this horse, I, it was the scariest thing, one of the scariest things I've ever seen. Jamie was with me, and I actually took my knife and started to go in and cut that rope because I said, this horse is going to kill itself. But the horse was going so quickly around that uh, railroad tie that I, I couldn't do it. I, I just had to stand there. And anyway, for probably 20 minutes, this horse gave it everything it had and it fought against that, and finally it got as far away, pulled on that thing, and it was a slip knot, and so it choked the horse, and it just fell down on the ground and passed out. <laughs> and I went up and sat on this horse's neck and took that rope off and tied it in between two railroad ties, and I took that halter off and put on a, a halter that would fit it, and anyway, when that horse got up, you could ride it. It was totally broken. His spirit was totally broken. That is not the way to break a horse. <laughs> but you, I could write. And anyway, it's a long, long story. But then right after that, I had to go back to work. And when I came back out, this horse had pitched a fit and got its uh, rear foot up in that nylon rope and cut it down to the bone. I, I brought a vet out, and the vet said, you're going to have to kill the horse, put it down. It's just so bad, it'll never recover. And I said, man... I can't do that. I'm responsible for all this. And so I started nursing this horse back to health. And I went out there every day. It was about a 30, 40 minute drive from our office. I went out there and I'd pray over this horse and sing to it and talk in tongues and all of this stuff and tell it, you know, you're going to be okay. And anyway, the horse recovered and made a full recovery and everything was okay. But my point is that when, after I had caught that horse and I turned it back loose in the pasture, it could see my green pickup coming. And it was a really proud looking Arabian. And it'd be standing there with its head up and its ears up and it was a nice looking horse. And it would see my green truck half a mile away and it would put its head down and its ears back and it'd just go to shaking like this. It'd just <laughs> shake. That horse would shake the whole time I was around it. And I told this horse, I said, you got the wrong impression of me. I saved your life. But all that horse can see is you nearly killed me. But I saved that horse's life. If I hadn't have done what I did, that horse would have died. They would have put it down and killed it. And it wasn't me that made that horse act that way. It was that wild nature inside of that horse that made it rebel at this and cost, and cost it all these problems. And anyway, I bring this up to say that I would tell this horse, I said, I'm really a nice guy. You do not know me. I said, I did not try and hurt you. But that horse, to the day I got rid of that horse, it would see me and it would go to shaking just like this. It would just quiver all over. And um, anyway, you know, God has done some things in the Word that people have misunderstood why he did it. I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but let me just say that when God gave the law which started punishing sin and causing many of the negative things that God has done in the Bible. He did it because of our wild nature. He had to corral us or the human race would have literally self-destructed. And even though God's, the law wasn't God's first choice or his best will for people, it was better than the alternative. It had, he had to do something to restrain the human race because we were about to destroy ourselves. And so the law was given, and through the law, people were hurt. There was wrath. Uh, death angels came, killed people, and did things like this. And from this, people have gotten the impression that God is this stern, angry, bitter God. But the Scripture says over in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, that God is love. He is love. He doesn't just have love. He is love. That is His core nature. That is the heart of God. And somebody said, well, if that's so, well, then why did God do this? That's what I hope to try and explain and to show you the consistent revelation of who God is all the way from Genesis to maps and put this into its proper perspective. And again, I say that Satan has taken things in the Bible, but he has twisted them just like he did this right here. And he says, yeah, the reason God said not to eat of the tree is because he doesn't want you to be like him. The truth is they were already like him. God didn't say that to be restrictive or to hurt them. It was to bless them. But Satan twisted it and maligned God. And he's doing the exact same thing today. 
And brothers and sisters, I believe that the majority of people sitting right here in this room have a wrong concept of who God is. If you knew how much he loved you, faith would work by love. Your faith would go through the roof. You would be so in love with God. Matter of fact, I, I, like I mentioned, we had a golf tournament today and I talked to a number of these guys as we played and, and there was two or three of them that they, this is what they said. They said, I have fallen so in love with God. I love God more than I've ever loved him in my life. I didn't know it was this good. Most people do not know how much God loves us and much of it comes because of misunderstanding about things that are in Scripture. You have to rightly divide the Word of God in order for it to work. Satan can use Scripture against you. Satan quoted Scripture to Jesus on the Mount of Temptation. Satan will pervert Scripture, and a little bit of knowledge of Scripture can get you into trouble. You need to know the Word of God and rightly divide it. And so I want to share some things with you about the goodness of God and show you why there was a period where there was so much wrath and punishment. And if you can receive this, it will make a huge difference in your life and in the way you relate to God. Let's turn, all, first of all, over to 2 Kings chapter 1. And the first thing I want to do is just point out some of the differences between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Sadly, again, most, most people are not good students of the Bible. And I'm not saying this to criticize anybody, but I'm just saying that we don't know the Word very well at all. And we've got to get established in some of these basic things. And so I'm going to show you that there's a difference between the Old Covenant, the way that God made a covenant with people in the Old Covenant, and in the New Covenant. Most people only see the difference between the Old and the New Covenant as one blank page in their Bible. But I tell you, the, there is a huge difference, and you cannot mix the two. This is the example that Jesus used, that you can't put new wine into an old wineskin. You can't put a new patch on an old garment. That was talking about you can't mix the old covenant and the new covenant. They are incompatible. And sad to say, the average Christian just mixes all of this together. And as far as they're concerned, the only difference between the old covenant and the new covenant is just one page. You just flip the page. But they still try and live under the precepts of the old covenant. Let me show you some things here in the old covenant that are completely unacceptable here in the new covenant. In 2 Kings chapter 1, this is where Ahaziah, the king of Israel, had fallen down through a roof, had hurt himself, got some kind of injury, apparently some kind of uh, infection, and it looked like he was going to die. And so he sent his servants to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, whether or not he would recover. And I wish I had time to put this in context, but this is the son of Ahab, who was a very ungodly king, and Elijah, the prophet, had prophesied that in the place that he killed a man so that he could take over his vineyard and shed that man's blood in that exact place that the dogs would lick his blood and the wife who was behind the whole thing, Jezebel, and made it happen that the dogs would eat her. And it came to pass just exactly the way he said that Ahab's blood was licked in that exact spot and the dogs ate everything except the skull, the palms of the hands, and the bottom of the feet of Jezebel. And she became dung upon the earth. So this is the guy, Elijah, and this is why Ahaziah didn't want to send to Elijah, the prophet, to find out because he, he had already gotten some bad news and seen what uh, Elijah's prophecies did. So he didn't want to go to him. So he sent his servants to Beelzebub, and Elijah got a word from the Lord, intercepted the messengers, and says, you go back and tell the man that sent you because you inquired of Beelzebub instead of the God of Israel because you did this, you will die on the bed that you're laying on. And when uh, the servants came back, they came back too quickly. Ahaziah said, why have you returned so quickly? And they, he said, because we men a man, a man menaced and said, thus saith the Lord, and told us that you're going to die on the bed that you've laid down on. And he said, what kind of man was he? And they said, he was a hairy man and girded about the loins with a leathern girdle. You know, I don't know exactly what all that means, but uh, Elijah must have been a real fashion statement because immediately, 
Ahaziah says, it's Elijah the Tishbite. That guy was known for the way he dressed and being hairy. <laughs> I've read some commentaries, they believe that his beard was way down past his waist, that he was just an old prophet. So anyway, when Ahaziah heard about this, he sent soldiers out against Elijah. And so in verse 9, it says, The king sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50, and he went to him, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill, and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king hath said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Man, that's pretty strong. You know, if somebody asked, came out against me and says, you man of God, the, pr the president has said do this, and I said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down and kill you, and boom, they just instantly are ashes. That'd be pretty impressive. <laughs> I can just see that old prophet, and then, <laughs> amen. <laughs> pretty awesome. And so it says in verse 11, again also he sent unto him another captain of 50 with his 50, and he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto him, unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee in thy 50. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him in his 50. You know, one of the points I'm going to make through this is that, see, God doesn't do this anymore. This is not the true nature and character of God. And some people might say, well, it was just coincidence or something. It was just a lightning bolt. Maybe it was the devil. Maybe it was just normal circumstance. But you can remove all of that kind of thinking by looking at this verse. It says the fire of God. This wasn't a coincidence. This wasn't the fire of the devil. This was God. Fire literally fell from heaven and consumed this 50 soldiers and their captain. So that's 102 people that God struck dead. And so in the next verse it says, And he sent again a captain of the third 50. Ahaziah was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. <laughs> he just could, somehow or another couldn't figure this one out. And it says, the third captain of 50 went up and he came and fell on his knees before Elijah and brought, besought him and said unto him, O man of God, I pray thee, let my life and the life of these 50 thy servants be precious in thy sight. Behold, there came down fire from heaven and burnt up the two captains of the former 50s with their 50s. Therefore, let my life now be precious in thy sight. And the angel of the Lord said unto Elijah, go down with him be not afraid of him. And he arose and went down with him unto the king, and he told the king, you're going to die on that bed. It came to pass. Elijah was protected, and it was not necessary that Elijah call fire down out of heaven. He finally went to the king, and God protected him. He didn't have to do this. And yet this is the way it was in the Old Testament. You find wrath, judgment, and punishment from God that is not acceptable in the New Covenant. Look over in Luke chapter 9, and let me contrast this with one of the examples of Jesus. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus was headed to Jerusalem. If you will remember, in John chapter 4, Jesus had already ministered to the woman at the well in Samaria, and she got born again, and the entire city of Samaria, the capital of Samaria, got turned on to the Lord. They accepted the Lord. And this was years before. So Jesus had already ministered in this area. These people had accepted him. But as he was headed down to Jerusalem, it says they wouldn't accept him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Look at this over in Luke chapter 9. And in verse... Um, 52, it says, And he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. Now this is significant because Jesus had already ministered in this area. They had accepted him, but it was because he ministered to that woman at the well and gave her a prophecy 
and they just came out and accepted him. But when it, it says specifically the reason they wouldn't receive him was because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And there's a reason behind this. The Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. Samaritans were people that were actually a mixture of races. Uh, the Syrians sent back colonists to dwell in the northern ten tribes when uh, the northern ten tribes were taken into captivity. And uh, they couldn't uh, possess the land because they didn't understand the ways of God. So the king of Syria sent some of the Jewish priests back to teach these Syrians how to offer sacrifices from God to God and go through the motions but it wasn't a pure conversion. They weren't committed to God. They just started incorporating godly principles into their own pagan worship. And one of the things that they did, the Syrians and the Jews intermarried, which was against what the Word of God says to do. So when the southern two tribes came back from Babylon, they came back and there were already these people called the Samaritans living there, but they had polluted the worship it was a polluted worship that actually had idolatry and worship of demons involved with the true worship of God. And they had married into these other races and that was against what the Word says. So the southern two kingdoms, they became Pharisees. And in the beginning, the Pharisees were actually positive things. They were trying to establish a national Jewish identity and what they did was reject those who had a mixed marriage and those who were worshiping God along with pagan gods and had perverted it. And so there was a rejection of the Samaritans. And over centuries, it just got worse and worse and worse to where you see in the Bible where Jesus gave the parable of the Good Samaritan and other things. And there's many scriptures that show the Jews and the Samaritans wouldn't even talk to each other. They hated each other. So the reason I bring all this out to say is that the Samaritans received Jesus when he just ministered to them, but when they saw that he was going to Jerusalem at the feast to worship with the Jews, which were their enemies, they rejected Jesus over that. Now this is important because this is much more significant than what Elijah encountered. Elijah didn't have to call fire down out of heaven and kill these 102 men because God protected him and took care of him. This, what happened to Jesus, this was the sinless son of God who is being snubbed because of a racial and a religious prejudice against him. This was total rejection. They knew who he was. They had received his ministry, but when they saw that he was going to identify with their enemy, with this racist group, they rejected Jesus. This was a much serious, ser more serious problem than what Elijah encountered over in 2 Kings chapter 1. And so when this happened, look at this in Luke chapter 9 and in verse 54, and when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did or Elijah? In other words, they turned back to 2 Kings chapter 1 and they wanted to call fire down out of heaven and kill all of these people who were rejecting the sinless Son of God just because he was going to go to Jerusalem and worship with their enemies. And how did Jesus respond to this? Look at this in verse 55. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy man's lives, but to save them. And they went unto another village. Amen. Jesus rebuked James and John for trying to copy and do what Elijah did. And when Elijah did it, it was right. It was the fire of God, not the fire of the devil. And they tried to emulate and do what the Old Testament prophet Elijah did, and they were rebuked. And so let me say this. This is going to shock some of you. But if Jesus would have been present in his physical body on this earth, bringing in the new covenant, Elijah would have been rebuked for calling fire down out of heaven. That was never God's best. So does that mean that Elijah was in sin? No, because under the covenant he was under, it was appropriate. And you find many things like this. But see, I'm using this to show you there's a difference 
between the way God dealt with people then and the way he deals with people now. And if you go back to the old covenant and try and use these principles to deal with people today, you are misrepresenting God. Jesus would rebuke you the same that he did James and John and say, you don't know what manner of spirit you're of. And somebody says, but it was done in the Bible right here. Well, James and John has precedent for what they were doing, but it was under a different covenant. There is a difference between the covenants. You know, I'll probably get into this more, so I won't give you the whole detail, but here's a little teaser that I'm going to talk about intercession. Moses prayed in Exodus chapter 32 and actually said, repent, told God to repent. He said, repent and turn from your fierce anger, O God. He told God to repent. And what's even more amazing about that, Exodus 32, 14 says God repented. <laughs> Moses told God to repent and he repented. But did you know in the New Covenant, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. In uh, Galatians chapter 3 it says Moses was a mediator that stood between God who was angry at the Jews and he mediated, he interceded for them and told God to turn from his fear of wrath and God did it. But Moses was a mediator. Abraham was a mediator when he pled for Sodom and Gomorrah. And you'll hear people using these examples and telling us how we're supposed to pray and intercede and say, Oh God, turn from your wrath over America and don't judge America because of our sins. And people go back and use that as a model. But 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, In the New Covenant, there's only one mediator. Moses was a mediator. Abraham was a mediator. David was a mediator. And it worked because they were under a covenant that, where Jesus hadn't come yet. And so it was appropriate for them. But today, Jesus has mediated, interceded with, between us and God, and he has mediated to end all of that type of mediation. And if a person today tries to pray like Moses and like David, and like Abraham did, you are taking the place that Jesus now only occupies. You would be anti-Christ to pray the way that David did, the way that Moses did, the way that Abraham did. You know, another example over in Psalms chapter 50. Let me just turn over and read this to you. In Psalms chapter 50, here's a prayer of David. And so many of the Psalms are like this. I hadn't got time to go through every one. But in Psalms chapter 50, this is where David repented. Of, or excuse me, it's Psalms chapter 51. This is where David repented of his sin with Bathsheba and murder of Bathsheba's husband. And he repented right here. And here are just some of the things that he said in Psalms chapter 51 in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. And on and on you could go. Did you know that this was appropriate for David to pray because Jesus had not come? And it was appropriate for him to pray this. But it is wrong for us to pray this. This is an insult against God. Some of you are looking at me strange. Have you ever heard this song, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. We sing that in the church today, and it's an insult against Jesus. Somebody says, well, what's wrong with that? The Bible says that when you get born again, God takes out of you a heart of stone and puts within you a heart of flesh. 
If you are born again, you have already had a new heart created on the inside of you. And for you to pray that, unless you're getting born again, if you've already been born again, for you to pray that is against the revelation of the New Testament. Plus, in the New Testament, he says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew chapter 28, verse 21. And it says in Hebrews chapter 13 that Jesus said that I will never leave you nor forsake you. So for you to pray and say, Oh Lord, take not your Holy Spirit from me. How could, he, how could he take his Holy Spirit from you? He's sworn by himself that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. For you to pray and say, Oh God, don't leave me is absolutely wrong. It means that you do not have a full revelation of God. If you're one of those that prays and says, Oh Lord, we ask you to come and be with us today. You're praying wrong. Somebody says, Well, what's wrong with that? He says, I'll never leave you. He says, where two or three of you are gathered together in my midst, in my name, there am I in the midst of you. Why would you ask God to come and be with you if he said that he's always with you? He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And then why do we pray these stu stupid prayers where we say, oh God, just go with us as we leave this place? What a stupid prayer. How's God going to answer a prayer like that? Is he going to leave you and then come back to answer your prayer? <laughs> See, we don't have the right understanding of God. I was talking to a woman tonight who had a great experience with the Lord for three years and now she doesn't feel it anymore. And that was one of those that I was saying, you're going to have to quit going by your feelings. Who cares how you feel? but I want to feel the presence of the Lord. You need to quit exalting feelings above the Word of God. And we need to get to where we go by what the Word says. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And you need to look at it that if you're sitting there and say, well, I know it says that, but I don't feel Him. Well, then you need to quit exalting your feelings above the Word of God. You need to go by what the Word says. And yet there's people that pray and ask God to come with us. We, they ask, say, and, oh God, please stretch forth your hand and heal this person. When the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes we were healed. It's already done. He sent his word and healed them. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead already lives on the inside of us. And yet people are asking God, oh God, touch me. They say, oh God, give me more faith. Jesus' disciples asked that same question and he said, you don't need more faith. Use what you've got. It's wrong to pray and ask for more faith. It says that every man has been given the measure of faith. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. And then Paul said that the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Galatians 2, 20. If Paul's measure was the faith of the Son of God, then you have the faith of the Son of God. I had a woman come up to me tonight and she says, oh, I just pray that I could have the kind of faith that you have. And I said, you do. <laughs> you've already got it. You just don't know what you've got. It says in Philemon chapter 1, verse 6, that the communication of your faith becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. You have as much of God as I do or anybody else. You have the same measure of faith, power, and anointing that Jesus had because it's the Spirit of Jesus in your heart. It's wrong for us to have double portion night. I don't know how many of you have been in Pentecostal churches, but they'll have double portion night. Come and we're going to anoint you with this oil that came from Jerusalem, made from olive oil. And when we put this on you, or when we pour this water from the River Jordan, you're going to get twice the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's a sham. You can't get twice of everything. It says the fullness of the Godhead dwells in us bodily. You cannot get twice as much. Somebody said, well, Elisha had twice the anointing on him that Elijah had on him. That's true. But that's because he was in the Old Covenant and he only had a small portion. You have the fullness of the Godhead bodily living on the inside of you. 
what Elijah had when he called fire down out of heaven and when he broke the drought and when he outran a chariot and when he raised a person from the dead and did all of these things. He only had a small portion. What we have on the inside of us is greater than what Elijah had. It's greater than what Elisha had. Somebody said, well, I don't see it. That doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means you haven't learned how to release it. And, one, and again, I go back to that verse I've already quoted. Philemon chapter 1, verse 6, that the communication, the word communication means transfer or release of your faith becomes effectual. That means it begins to work by the acknowledging of every good thing which is already in you in Christ Jesus. The body of Christ as a whole is saying, oh God, I am nothing, I have nothing, but you can do all things. Touch me, move in my life. Oh God, give me something. You've already started in unbelief when you pray that way because the Bible says you've already got it. You're already blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, that you've already been given all power and all dominion. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, it's already been done, and yet we're praying like Old Testament saints. We don't understand the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and we're wondering why we aren't seeing the same results that Elijah saw, that Elisha saw. It's because they used what they had we don't believe we've got anything, and we're asking God to give us more. Oh, God, give me more faith. You don't need more faith. You've already got the same faith that Jesus used. Your faith is the faith of Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, I believe, says, You are saved by the faith of Christ. Not faith in Christ, but the faith of Christ. God literally gave you his faith to get born again with. You got everything that you need, but we aren't acknowledging what we've got because, again, we go back to the Old Testament mindset where we're crying out and asking God to come and touch people and, and do things. You know, this is also why in the Old Testament that the Lord told people to go in and kill the men, the women, the children, and the animals, anything that breathed, let them all die. Did you know today we look at that and hopefully all of you understand that that is not how we're supposed to operate as New Testament saints. <laughs> Did you know in the Old Covenant, if your children cursed you, you took them to the elders and they reprimanded them. And if they did it a second time, you had to stone them to death. The parents had to be the very first one to throw the stone. Most of us would be dead. We don't kill our children now if they're rebellious. Why not? It's in the Bible. It's a command. And if you don't do it, you're guilty. Why don't we do that today? The reason for it is because in the Old Testament, people could not be born again. They could not be delivered. The only way to deal with demon-possessed people, which is what the people that... The Lord told them to go in and kill the men, women, children, and the animals. It was because these people were given over to total demonic stuff. The reason they had to kill the animals is because it was common practice to have bestiality. Homosexuality was norm. Bestiality was the norm. Women were having sex with animals. Men were having sex with animals. They were demon-possessed. You couldn't be delivered before you were born again and before the power of the Holy Spirit was given. And so it was like a cancer or something in our body. Today, you go in and you cut off those parts of your body. And even though that's a terrible, severe thing and we think how harsh that is, it's an attempt to save the entire body. The human race was becoming run over with demon-possessed people that had given themselves over to demon practices, even offering their children in sacrifice to demon gods. And in the Old Covenant, the only way to deal with that was like a cancer. You just had to go in and kill it. That's the only way you could stop those demons from operating through people. But in the New Testament, you can be born again. You can be changed. You can be delivered. And so you don't kill your children if they smart off. Amen. It says over in 1 Samuel chapter 15, I think it's around verse 22 or 23, it says, Stubbornness is as the sin of iniquity, 
and rebellion is as an idolatry and witchcraft. I misquoted that a little bit, but it's something similar to that. It likens rebellion and stubbornness to iniquity, idolatry, and it's demonic. And so in the Old Testament, if somebody was rebellious, kill them. That's the only way you could get rid of the demonic spirit behind it. Today, they can be born again. They can be delivered, and you don't kill them today. Jesus changed everything, and yet I've, gi I've given you how many examples here? I don't know, many of them. Many, many examples. And yet the average Christian reads the Old Testament and believes that that's how we're supposed to live. There is a difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The Old Covenant revealed God as a harsh, wrathful God. Not that it was incorrect, because He is holy, and He certainly has power, and there certainly is coming judgment. But that wasn't God's true nature. That wasn't the way that he wanted to reveal himself. Just think of this, and I'm going to go into this in more detail. But if that was the true nature of God, why didn't he treat Adam and Eve that way from the very beginning? Why did he wait 2,000 years before he gave the law and started punishing people? It's because the true nature of God is love. And when Adam and Eve sinned, instead of punishing them, he actually made them coats of skin to cover their shame, and he still fellowshiped with them, and he still loved them. Man, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Turn over here to Romans chapter 5, and let me take this passage. Romans chapter 5. In verse 8, it says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man... Sin entered into the world. Man, I wish I had time to explain that. Most people do not understand this. They think it's what you did that made God angry. They think, well, I did this and I know God is mad at me. God got mad at sin that came into the world through one man, not through your actions. It's not your actions that upset God. It was the sin of the human race, the sin nature, if I had time to explain this to you, there's something like 43 times that the word, uh, I can't pronounce it, but this Greek word is used, and it's translated sin, singular, all but one time in the book of Romans. Sin, singular. It's not talking about sins, plural, actions that you do. It's talking about the sin nature that you inherited, and that sin nature came into the world through one man. You were born a sinner. You didn't sin that made you a sinner. You were born with a sin nature, and that's the reason that you committed sins. You know, when I have people come forward, I lead them in a prayer. And I'll have them repeat after me and I'll say, Father, I'm sorry for my sin, singular. And the people every time will say, I'm sorry for my sins, plural. But I believe that Jesus died to forgive my sin, singular. And the people will say, I believe Jesus died to forgive my sins. Sins aren't the problem. It's the sin nature that's the problem. And sin, nature, entered the world through Adam. Your sins just confirmed and bore witness. It was proof that you had a sin nature. But it's not your sins that gave you a sin nature. It's your sin nature that made you sin. There's a difference. And if you understood this, it would change your whole relationship with God. So anyway, it says right here, For until the law, sin or excuse me, that's back in verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, not by sins, but by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now that last word there, sinned, is talking about your physical actions. Your physical actions 
or what cemented this sin nature and imputed that unto you. Romans chapter 7 talks about that. In verse 13 it says, For until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. What a radical statement that is. Sin is not imputed when there is no law. You know, the word impute is a word that we don't use very much today. We use the concept all of the time, but we don't use the word. But it's an accounting word is what it means. It means to record or to charge against you. For instance, when you use a credit card, you aren't paying for whatever it is that you're buying. You're giving them information on that little magnetic strip and they impute it unto you. They record it against you. And if you don't think that's so, well then when your credit card bill comes, don't pay it. <laughs> Tell them, hey, I've already paid it. I gave my credit card at the store. All you did was have it imputed unto you. You didn't pay it. You have to pay the bill when it comes. And so that's what the word impute means. And this is saying that God doesn't impute. He doesn't record sins against you when there is no law. And if you take all of this in context, I could prove this to you if I had enough time. This is talking about until the law of Moses, which came 2,000 years after the fall of Adam, God wasn't imputing men's trespasses unto them. He wasn't recording them against them. He was operating in mercy and love towards people, not judgment and punishment. Now again, this is contrary to what most of us have been taught and have assumed from religion. For instance, let's turn back over to Genesis chapter 3. When Adam and Eve sinned, the average person believes that God, here was holy God, and now man had fallen from being holy and he was unholy and holy God could not fellowship with unholy man and so God drove man out of the garden away from his presence because there was this huge rift between God and man. That's not what Romans chapter 5 verse 13 says. Until the law, sin wasn't being imputed, held against people. So look at this closely here in Genesis chapter 3. This is after their sins, after the Lord had made them coats of skins to cover their nakedness. It says in Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 22, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. In verse 23, it says, Therefore... The Lord God sent him forth. The word therefore means this is the reason. This is why. When you see the word therefore, you need to look and see what it's there for. It's linking this back to the previous verse. And the reason he sent man out of the garden was because he didn't want them to take of the tree of life and eat it and live forever. That wasn't punishment. That was mercy. And I know some of you think, well, man, he, he, he made us die because we didn't have the tree of life. We were already sinners. We already had this sin nature. And all of the fruit of sin, the wages of sin, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, is death. Can you imagine living forever in a body that was subject to being like Down syndrome? Could you imagine a, a person that couldn't die, they could live forever, but they were totally, you know, just out of it mentally. Or a person that had pain and deformities, blindness, deafness, all of the problems that have affected the human race and you couldn't die, you just live forever like that. Could you imagine Hitler living forever? Mussolini, Saddam Hussein, and these people, you couldn't kill them. They just continued to function. And if we had Genghis Khan and every evil, wicked person that has ever ruled on the face of the earth alive right now with all of their armies, can you imagine what the earth would be like? 
As bad as death is, and it never was, God's first choice, it's better, death is better than living forever in a sinful state. I don't know if any of you ever saw this movie, Tuck Everlasting, but I like that movie. And it's about a person that drank of this spring and they couldn't die. And anyway, his family had been alive for two, three hundred years. They could be shot, hung, anything, and they couldn't die. And this one girl found this group and, and the boy supposedly loved her. He was like 200 years old. He only looked like he was 18. And he wanted to marry her, but he had to tell her their secret and tuck took this girl out on a boat on the lake and began to say, you need to consider this because if you drink of this spring and if you live forever, he says, we don't live. He says, we're just like a rock. We just are. And he pointed to everything and he says, the trees, they go in a cycle. There's this birth and death and, and rebirth and you see things. And anyway, the way that that show presented it, you saw that actually living forever in a sinful, corrupted world with all of the problems that we have, that would be torment. If there was no heaven where we're going to get a new glorified body and whatever we have wrong with us will be fixed and we are going to get a new heaven and new earth where there's no wickedness and there's no evil and there's no more sorrow and there's no more crying, no more tears. We've, we've got something through Jesus that is so much better than this life that even though you don't, you don't covet death and you don't want to die, we've got something much better than this life. And the Lord knew that and it was mercy when he drove Adam and Eve out of the garden and kept them for eating of the tree of life and living forever in a sinful, corrupted body. It was the mercy of God that did that, not judgment and punishment. See, people think immediately God just kicked man out of his presence, but he didn't. He just took them away from the tree of life as an act of mercy because now we had such a substandard life compared to what God created us to be that he had something better planned and he didn't want us living forever in a sinful, corrupted body. And you can see in the fourth chapter, look at some of these things. In the fourth chapter, right after he drove them out of the garden, it says in chapter 4, verse 1, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Now, before I get into the rest of this, let me just ask you this. How did Cain and Abel know to bring offerings? There isn't anything in Scripture that God told them to do this. Where did they get this from? Somebody could go back into the third chapter and say, well, when he killed an animal and made clothes out of their skins, that was a type and a symbol of it, and they, that must be where they got it. It's possible, but... Cain brought an offering of his first fruits of the ground. He was a tiller of the ground. And you couldn't have gotten that from the killing of an animal. And yet, over in the book of Leviticus, you are commanded to bring the first fruits of your crop. Some people say that the reason God respected Cain's, I mean Abel's offering and rejected Cain's was because Abel's was a blood sacrifice. Cain was a sacrifice from the ground. But it was commanded in, Le in Leviticus to offer the fruit of your ground as a sacrifice. And over in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, it says by faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. I don't believe it was the substance because it was commanded to offer these things from the ground. It was the fact that Abel did it by faith, Cain did it just out of obligation. Where did they get this knowledge that you were supposed to do this? They certainly didn't get the knowledge about offering the first fruits of the ground from some slaying of an animal. Well, the logical answer, if you read this in its context, God was talking to them in an audible voice. 
And the logical answer is that God just told them about this. God instructed them. In other words, he did not break off fellowship with them when they sinned. He didn't kick them out and have nothing to do with man and they were on their own. He was still walking and talking with them. And when they offered this sacrifice, there was some way that God showed acceptance of Abel and rejection of Cain. We don't know for sure what that was. Maybe he consumed the sacrifice. Maybe there was a fire. That was done in Leviticus chapter 9, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Or maybe he spoke in an audible voice because right here in this chapter, he talks to him in an audible voice. But God was still in fellowship and in communion with man. He did not break off his relationship with man. He was not imputing their sins unto them. He was still being merciful to people right here after sin entered into the world. And so let's continue to read. In verse uh, 6 it says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? Now here is God talking to Cain in an audible voice. And it didn't surprise Cain at all. Again, this shows that he was used to hearing the voice of the Lord. If thou doest well, thou shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well sin lieth at the door, and unto thee, talking about Abel, shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Anyway, I hadn't got time to explain all of that. In verse 8 it says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Now get a picture of this. Here's Cain had just killed his brother. This is the first time anybody had ever been murdered on the face of the earth. You know, this is hard for us to relate to because I saw a stat once that the average child by the time they graduate from high school is seen in excess of 150,000 brutal murders on television. The average child is seen in excess of 150,000 brutal murders Nobody had ever seen a murder. There's no way that Cain was desensitized to this. It had never happened. He had killed his brother. And while he still had blood on his hands, an audible voice from heaven, Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he just turns around and lies to God, puts his you know, blood-stained hands behind his back. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? You know, think about this. If you had just murdered somebody, if you were the first person that had ever murdered a person on the face of the earth, nobody else had ever done it. And if an audible voice out of heaven says, what have you done? Most of you would die right there. <laughs> they wouldn't have to prosecute you. You'd die of a heart attack. For Cain to just lie to God, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? You know what that shows? It shows familiarity breeds contempt. He wasn't shocked to hear the voice of God. This wasn't unusual unto him. And what this does, it shows that God was still walking and talking and fellowshipping with man. Matter of fact, you can go on and as God talked to him, it says, I think in verse 16 right here, that Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. How can you go out from the presence of the Lord if you didn't have the presence of the Lord? You can't leave something that you didn't have. You can't get out of this room if you were never in it. For you to leave the presence of the Lord, he had to have the presence of the Lord. So I've given you about three or four different indications in this one chapter that when God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, he didn't do it to break fellowship. He was still fellowshipping and still talking to man in an audible voice and communicating with them. God did not just cut mankind off. There were consequences to their sin. He drove them out of the garden because he didn't want them eating of the tree of life and living forever. And there were consequences. But he did not hate them. Matter of fact, instead of punishing the first murderer on the face of the earth, he put a mark in Cain, because Cain says, now everybody that hears about this, and of course everybody that could have heard about it would have been his parents, other uh, sisters, and people like that, just family members. He says, they're all going to seek to kill me. 
And so God had mercy on the first murderer and actually put a mark on him and said, if anybody touches Cain, I'll avenge his death seven times. He protected the first murderer, not because he approved of murder, but he was still merciful. He wasn't imputing their sins. There were consequences to it. You can't go out and hit your thumb with a hammer without it hurting, but that doesn't mean that God's the one that caused it. There were consequences to them living like this, but God wasn't punishing them. He was extending mercy to them. But later in this same chapter, let me just turn over here and read it. This is in Genesis chapter 4. And um, verse 23, it says, And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah. Lamech was the very first person to have multiple wives, which Jesus said was never God's will. He just intended for one man to have one woman. But Lamech had two wives, and God didn't punish him for it. God still loved Lamech. He said, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. In the old English here, this is a little confusing, but if you look this up in the Greek, what he's actually saying is he killed a man in self-defense. And so he felt like his murder of a person was self-defense and it was more justifiable than what Cain had done. And so he goes on to say in verse 24, If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. So he says, if Cain got by with murder and God said, I'm going to avenge anybody who tries to punish Cain seven times, he says, well, then God is going to avenge me 77 times. You know what's wrong with that? God didn't say that. Lamech said it. He thought he was more justified in killing a man than Cain was, and so he just assumed. If Cain got by with murder... Well, I'm certainly going to get by with it because I'm more deserving than what Cain was. And see, this is what the scripture talks about. I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, but they comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves are not wise. And yet this is what people do constantly. They, they say, well, this person over here, look what they did. And they got by with it, and they're still prosperous, and they still have the respect of people. And See, you know, 50 years ago, homosexuality was still wrong, but people didn't brag about it. They didn't have parades. No, they wouldn't have ever had a parade and have told you they were homosexual. They were homosexuals, but they were at least ashamed about it. But nowadays, after having Rock Hudson and some of the movie stars come out and admit that they're homosexual, having a football player admit he's homosexual, having this happen, it has lost a lot of its stigma because people compare themselves. And they say, this person is very prosperous. They're on the front of the magazines. They do this. And all of a sudden, our standards become relative to our culture instead of fixed on the Word of God. We do the same thing. We compare ourselves and because this person is a politician and they are in government and everybody respects them and they have power and they got by with it, well, it must not be wrong. That doesn't make it right. Just because you say a lie a thousand times or a million times, it's still a lie. It doesn't change anything just because a lot of people believe it. But see, we do the same thing. We compare ourselves, and this is what Lamech was doing. Lamech was saying, Cain got by with murder. I'm going to get by with murder. And this is why God had to bring the law. Because people were comparing themselves among themselves. And they were thinking, well, this person, they're, they're respected. They, they've got some good in them, and yet they're completely against what the Word of God teaches. And so, you know what? It must not be so bad. And because God wasn't judging sin and punishing sin and bringing his wrath upon sin, he didn't kill Cain. And because of that, Lamech was emboldened to go out and kill a man. And on and on and on you could go. It just got worse and worse and worse. Eventually, God had to start punishing and releasing wrath against us for our sins to show us that sin was deadly. See, even though, 
I, I phrase it this way. It's like there's a twofold effect to sin. There was one that was like a vertical effect, a transgression against God, and it deserved punishment. God was not imputing man's sins unto them until the time of the law. He was not bringing his punishment upon sin. He was being merciful. But men were taking God's lack of punishment as approval or acceptance. And because of that, we were getting a wrong impression of what right and wrong was. We were looking around because people didn't just drop dead the moment they sinned. We couldn't see the visible effects of sin. We thought, well, it's really not that bad. And so they were just going out and living in sin. So God wasn't bringing his judgment, but there's a second uh, effect of sin, and that's over in Romans chapter 6, verse 16. It says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you yield yourself to sin, you are yielding yourself to Satan, the author of that sin, and he is going to come eat your lunch and pop the bag. <laughs> and so sin has a consequence. Even if God doesn't judge it, it has this horizontal effect where it allows Satan to come into your life. And even though God wasn't punishing sin, if God hadn't have done something to restore our perspective back to what is right and wrong and place fear on the inside of us that would have made us limit the amount of sin that we did, if God hadn't have done something to restrain it, there literally would not have been a virgin left on the earth for Jesus to have come into this earth through. That's how bad it was getting. In the days of Noah, there was only one man and his seven family members that God considered to be worthy of saving. The rest were like a cancer, and God had to cut this cancer out. Some of you may be thinking, well, I thought God wasn't imputing sin. Again, you, you could look at it and say, well, he judged those people in the days of Noah. But if you look at the human race as a whole, it was a merciful thing because the human race was becoming so contaminated with evil that God killed that cancer and spared. Uh, he, he would have been just in wiping out Noah and all his family, but he, he did it really as an act of mercy. It was judgment on those individuals, but it was mercy upon the human race as a whole because he, Jesus said that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. We are just now, just now beginning to get back to how bad it was in the days of Noah. As bad as things are, it was infinitely worse. Bestiality was the rule of the day. Everybody was having sex with animals. Women allowing animals to have sex with them. That was the common practice. And God had to stop this. So this is why the law came. If God wanted to give the law, why did he wait 2,000 years to speak it to Moses when that was exceptional for a person to hear the audible voice of God in the days of Moses? In the days of Adam, he was talking to them every day and communicating with them. It would have been much easier. It would have been much more economical it would, have been, it would have saved energy for him to just communicate the law directly to Adam and Eve right then. Why didn't he give them the Ten Commandments? Because that never was his will. He didn't want us to know all of these things. Think about this. You know, this front row right here, these are all employees. These are all turned on, born again, spirit-filled people. Amen. They love God. And yet, if God would have just shown them what was going to happen in Wendell's life and in Larry and Donna's and David and Gail and Jamie and me and Larry and Donna, if he would have just taken these few people right here and have shown them all of the hurt and the tragedy, their parents dying, friends, relatives dying, sickness and disease, people rejecting them. And that's not even including World War I, World War II, the Civil War, millions and millions and millions of people that have died. If he would have shown Adam and he says, all right, let me tell you what your sin has done. I believe that Adam would have just died right there. I don't think he could have lived with himself. The only thing that they knew was they were naked. 
That is relatively minor compared to the rape, the murder, the drug addiction, the homosexuality, the drunkenness, everything else that's gone on. He didn't want them to know how bad it was. He could have given them the law. The law is the knowledge of sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. He didn't want to give them a knowledge of their sin. All they knew was they were naked and that was more than enough to make them condemned. The Lord didn't want them to, show, to know how bad it was. But because other people saw him not punishing people's sins and because of it they just started saying, well, if Cain gets by with murder, I'm going to get by with murder. And on and on. God finally, and it says this in Galatians chapter 3. I'm going to go through these things in more detail uh, this week as we go through it. But in Galatians chapter 3, it says the law was added because of transgression. It was not God's first choice. God never wanted you to know all of these laws and to realize how sinful and how ungodly you were. It was added because mankind was so out of control, God had to do something to restrain the amount of sin. And when God gave the law, all of a sudden, our conscience came back to normal. And we quit justifying ourselves and saying, well, everybody's doing it. And all of a sudden we realized, uh-oh, man, if this is God's standard, I'm guilty. And it brought knowledge of sin and it brought condemnation and it brought guilt, which was beneficial because it did restrain the amount of sin, but it also empowered sin. You know, I can't tell you everything I know in one night. I'm going to show you scriptures tomorrow that will say things about the law that is going to shock most of you. The law strengthens sin. The law made sin come alive. The law condemns. The law kills. It does not give life. It is not good. It was beneficial at a time, but it is not for us today. And that's the reason that God waited 2,000 years to give the law. And yet the average Christian today is totally committed to the law. Totally committed to living by the law and it was never intended for you to live by. It is not a beneficial thing. The only benefit to the law is to show you how sorry you are so that you'll repent of your self-righteousness and turn to Jesus for salvation. But once you turn to Jesus, the law is not good for you. It's bad for you. I know some of you are thinking, I can't believe you said that. I'm quoting scripture to you. I paraphrased it. You come back. If you're brave enough to come back, <laughs> I'll show you scriptures that prove exactly what I'm saying. And see, if you've understood what I'm talking about tonight, maybe it's giving you a different impression of God. That he started punishing not because that was his first choice. He waited 2,000 years, but he had to do it in order to show us how far off track we were to make sin come alive so that we would quit thinking that we were okay on our own. It was to show us our need for a Savior. But the law could point out what was wrong. It could point you how far short you've come, but it could not save you. You need faith in the mercy and the grace of God in order to do that. And I tell you, I'll continue this. I'm not through. I don't ever finish. I just quit. And we're going to start again in the morning. And I've got some things to share with you that I think are going to make a big, big difference in your life. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, we thank you for the Word of God and thank you for the revelation of these truths. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit but take the things that I've said here tonight and show people that have been confused in this area that you are a good God and that you are a God of love, that that is your nature and your core and you only gave the law as a last resort until Jesus could come. And now that Jesus has come, we aren't under this law. We aren't living by the Old Testament that we don't have to kill our rebellious children and Father, we operate under a different covenant. I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would just make this alive and real to people and that we would open up our heart to understand and receive a new revelation of your goodness for us. 
So Father, we thank you and I believe that that's taking place. I ask that for any person in here tonight that doesn't know you personally, that you would help these people to open up their heart and receive this good God who is merciful unto us and our sins and iniquities that you will not remember anymore. Father, I pray that people would receive that forgiveness, that they would receive the power of the Holy Spirit in their life here tonight. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let me give an invitation here that if you don't know Jesus, maybe you're a person that was thinking, but I'm doing good. I'm trying to keep all of these laws. It's not about you living holy. It's not sins, plural, that's the problem. It's sin, singular, the sin nature. And if you would just repent of that and say, Father, forgive me for this sin nature. Forgive me that I am a fallen human being, that I was born in sin, and I receive salvation as a gift. If you would do that tonight, you could pass from death unto life. You could be changed in your nature, and then your nature will eventually change your actions. If you don't know Jesus, you need to make him your personal savior tonight. And also, if you are born again, but if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then you need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And this includes many things. It's not just this gift of speaking in tongues, but speaking in tongues is one of the main parts of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When they received that in the Bible, they spoke in tongues. And I know I'm in the belt buckle of the Bible belt, and not everybody believes in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Probably some of you see me on television, and because I don't act Pentecostal and spit and say glory to God, uh, you didn't realize I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I am. I speak in tongues, and I'm telling you, it's essential. You need this gift of speaking in tongues. Somebody says, well, they don't believe that in my church. That's the reason I'm not in your church. <laughs> but it's the truth. Somebody says, are you saying you got to speak in tongues to go to heaven? No, you can go to heaven without speaking in tongues and you can get there quicker <laughs> if you don't speak in tongues because you aren't going to have power. Jesus said you would have power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I believe you can be born again. You, you can even be baptized in the Holy Spirit and not speak in tongues. I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit and I'm not speaking in tongues right now. I could speak in tongues right now, but I'm not. But does that mean I'm not baptized in the Holy Spirit? No, I am baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I'm not speaking in tongues. You could be baptized in the Holy Spirit and not speaking in tongues. But why? Amen. It's a great gift. It's powerful. You could get a pair of pants with only one leg in it, but what's the point? Man, I tell you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is awesome. You'd have never seen me on television if I hadn't received the baptism. I was born again 10 years before I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it changed my life. So you may not be sure about all of this because this is not what your church teaches, but I tell you, I am absolutely sure. If you aren't sure, you ought to take the word of somebody who is. I'm telling you, you need this baptism of the Holy Spirit. It releases power in your life. So if, if you're here tonight and if you either need to make Jesus your Lord and be born again and have this sin nature changed or if you've already done that and you know you're born again but you don't have this baptism of the Holy Spirit and you don't speak in tongues, I'd like to pray with you and help you to receive because these are two things that every person in this room needs. You need it. It's absolutely essential. And if you don't have it, I'd like to pray with you and help you. If, if you would like prayer for one or both of those, I'd like you to raise your hand right now and let me pray with you and help you to receive. If that's you, just be bold and raise your hand right where you are. we got people all over this auditorium. Praise God. I know that there's others that didn't raise your hand and you're thinking, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't have a church for you to join. I'm not going to take anything from you. I'm going to give you a free book. I'm going to pray for you. We want to help you. I'm not here to take anything from you. I want to give to you. So you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. 
So if you raised your hand, or if you were supposed to raise your hand but didn't do it, would you just get up out of your seat and come forward, stand right here, and I want to pray with you and help you to receive here tonight. Come forward right now. Let me pray with you. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Awesome. Man, isn't this great? It's going to change your life. You're never going to be the same. I tell you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit changed my life more outwardly than salvation did. Salvation, of course, is the foundation. I had to be born again. I'm not minimizing that, but that's inward. That's when you get changed inwardly. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is when you start releasing that out into your life. And I tell you, this changed me more than anything else. I believe that this has the potential to radically, radically change your life. Anybody else here? You know, I know in my heart that there's people sitting out there that you don't speak in tongues and yet you didn't come forward. Maybe you don't think it's important. Maybe you want to think about it a while. Let me just tell you, what has your thinking about it done for you all of these years? It hadn't made you any closer to speaking in tongues. Somebody's probably thinking, well, what if I go up there and nothing happens? I can guarantee you if you don't come up here, nothing's going to happen. You got nothing to lose. You got everything to gain. Somebody's saying, well, I just don't understand it. Let me think about it. You know what? If God has spoken to you, if in your heart you're saying, I want everything that God has for me, but I just don't know about this. The scripture says, if you be an evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? God's not going to let anything bad happen to you. The worst thing that could happen is for you to come up here and get a free book and go home. That's the worst thing that could happen. <laughs> but there's nothing bad going to happen to you. There's no reason not to come up here. If you don't speak in tongues, you ought to be up here. Amen. You know, I'm not going to hold it here very long, but I just know in my heart that there's other people out there, and for whatever reason, you aren't coming. I'm telling you, you need this. You need this. It'll change your life. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Some of you are thinking, man, what would my group think about me? Well, they already are going to talk about you for coming to this meeting, amen. You might as well get something for it. Praise God. All right, before I can pray with you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that first of all, you have to receive Jesus as your personal Savior. He's the one who gives the Holy Spirit. So you have to receive the giver before you receive the gift. If there's anybody here who's not absolutely certain that you've already had your nature changed, that Jesus is your Lord and that you've been born again, if you aren't certain about that, I need to pray with you first because you won't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit until you receive Jesus, the one who gives the Holy Spirit. So if you aren't sure, there's a lot of people that just are assuming and they think, well, I know that there's a God. The Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 19, it says, you believe that there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. But won't you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. You have to do more than believe that there's a God. You have to commit your life to Him. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's more than just saying the words. You have to make Him Lord. You have to make a commitment to Him. It's not saying that you'll never make a mistake because that's impossible. You're human. You will fail. But you have to be willing to literally Make Jesus the Lord of your life. Turn your life over to Him. Is there anybody down here who's not done that and we need to pray with you first? If that's you, I want you to raise your hand so that I can pray with you. Anybody? Here's one right here. Anybody else? Here's a couple more down here. Anybody else? Are you sure? I'm not trying to talk you out of your faith in the Lord, but I'm just saying if you aren't sure, we need to pray and make sure. Amen. Anybody else? Here's another one. Praise God. 
So I think this was five or so. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to say things similar to what you need to say. It's not magic. It's not like you just say these words and automatically it comes to pass. You have to believe it in your heart. But if you will pray these words after me and mean it, then you'll be born again. Your nature will be changed. God will come into your life. So I'd like to ask everybody in here to repeat this with me. And remember when I pray that we're repenting of our sins, singular, and not sins, plural. Amen. So say this. Say, Father, I'm sorry for my sin. I believe Jesus died to forgive my sin. And I receive that forgiveness. Jesus, I make you my Lord. I believe that you are alive, that you now live in me. I am forgiven. I am saved right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Did you mean that? Amen. You know, if you meant that, you just passed from death unto life. That's awesome. You know, on the outside, you're still a man or a woman. You're still white or black. You're still short or tall. But you know what? On the inside, you're a brand new person. You can't see it, but you just became a new person. And the Bible says that you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's important because that means that this is what God made you for, is to be a dwelling place for His Holy Spirit. So now we're going to pray and receive the Holy Spirit. And you don't have to wonder, will He give the Holy Spirit to me? He made you for this. God wants this more than you want it. Some people will teach that you can't have any sin in your life. You've got to get every sin out of your life before God could fill you with the Holy Spirit. If you could get holy without the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be holy. Matter of fact, if you got sin in your life, you're the very person God wants to fill with the Holy Spirit so that you can have power to overcome that sin. So don't let some sense of unworthiness keep you from receiving. We're just going to pray a real simple prayer and open up the doors of our heart and welcome the Holy Spirit to come into these temples. And he promised that he would do it. And then we've got all of these prayer ministers. I'd like to ask them to come up here and stand behind you. And the reason I'm doing this is because we're going to pray and we're going to open up our hearts and let the Holy Spirit in. But then the Bible says that through the laying on of hands, the Holy Spirit is given. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer where we open up our heart. And then these people are going to lay hands on you and release this power of the Holy Spirit into you. And so we're going to do that. And then after they lay hands on you, I want you to quit asking for the Holy Spirit and instead believe that He came and just start thanking Him. I don't care what you feel like. When I received the Holy Spirit, I didn't feel a thing. But I just by faith believe that I received. So we're going to pray. They're going to lay hands on you. And after they do that, I want you to put your hands in the air like this. Because when you lift up your hands, the Bible says in Psalms 130-something, it says, lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. This blesses God when you lift your hands what the Bible says. It's like when somebody sticks a gun in your back and you lift your hands and you go, I surrender. I yield. This is your way of yielding to God. So at that time, I want you to lift your hands and start thanking God that He's already given you the Holy Spirit. Don't ask anymore, but thank Him. Take a step of faith and thank Him. And then these people behind you are going to start praying in tongues because the Bible says that when we pray in tongues, you give thanks. Well, you're praising God in the heavenly language. So we're going to start praying in tongues and thanking God. And at that time, I want you to quit praying in English and start praying in tongues. And just join in with us and go to speaking. Amen? That was a question. Amen?
Some of you are thinking, well, I don't know how to speak in tongues. What do I do? Here's my last instruction, then we're going to pray. Some people wait on the Holy Spirit to force them to speak in tongues. They think it just is, He's going to take control of you and you can't help it. It just comes out. That's not how it happens. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, they spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. The Holy Spirit doesn't speak in tongues. He inspires you and you have to speak. He will not force you to speak in tongues. It's exactly the same as when I spoke tonight. I believe that the Holy Spirit spoke through me, but He didn't take my mouth and make me talk. If I would have just opened up my mouth and said, Oh God, speak through me tonight, and then open up my mouth and stick my tongue out and just wait on God to make it talk, nothing would have happened. We'd still be looking at each other. I spoke. It was me that talked. That's the reason it came out in Texan. But you know what? I believe God inspired it. And that's the way speaking in tongues is. You have to speak. You have to make sound and by faith believe that the Holy Spirit's given it to you. And I promise you that if you, once you get over the newness of it and quit listening to yourself and wondering, is this God? You'll find out it just flows out of you and it'll be different languages and God will confirm to you that this is the Lord. But you're going to have to sit there and by faith believe that God gave you the Holy Spirit and start speaking. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. The Bible says believers will speak with new tongues. I want you to say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. And I will, speak in tongues. I will speak in tongues. Father, I thank you for these. Thank you for these that prayed tonight and got born again according to the Word of God. They are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. All of us down here are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we open up the doors of these temples. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you to come into our lives right now and to fill our vessels. Come live in your dwelling place. We want your power your anointing. We want this gift of speaking in tongues and all of the other gifts. So we open up our hearts right now in Jesus' name. We lay hands on you and say, Receive the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. We loose this power to flow into your life right now in the name of Jesus. Man, here's the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit flowing in your life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Right now, those of you that know how to pray in tongues, let's pray in tongues. And those of you down here, let's lift your hands. Start thanking God for giving you the Holy Spirit. And let's start speaking in tongues right now. If you don't know what to say, you can say what you hear the person behind you saying, but your tongue won't be the same as theirs. It'll be unique to you. It'll come out different. And once you start saying something different, just keep talking. Don't quit. Just keep talking. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Don't worry about what it sounds like. When a little child first talks, it doesn't sound like English, but that father knows that that little child is trying to say, Daddy. Your heavenly father is listening to your heart. Right now, you're bypassing your brain and you're praying out of your spirit. You're bypassing your doubt and your unbelief. You're saying words. You're praying in a heavenly language and you're releasing faith. Just speak right now. You can't speak in tongues in English at the same time. Quit praying in English and talk in tongues. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, we agree and we receive. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Boy, many, many, many of these 
are speaking in tongues. Isn't that awesome? Thank you, Jesus. Father, thank you for giving us all the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for this gift of speaking in tongues. Let me have your attention here for just a minute. I'm sorry to interrupt you. But you know, even if you didn't speak in tongues right now, I believe God gave you the Holy Spirit because he promised that he would. You've got it. Somebody said, but I didn't speak in tongues. But you got it. It's like when you get a pair of tennis shoes. They all come with tongues. Amen. You got it. God gave you this. You just have to release it. Actually, the very first time I prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I didn't speak in tongues the very first time. But that's because I was a Baptist. And I had been taught that this was of the devil and I just had so many fears and confusion about it that it took me three and a half years before I started speaking in tongues. But you know what? I do it. And I wrote all of the things that I know about this in a book. And I don't think anybody's had more questions and more doubt about speaking in tongues than I did. And yet I got over it. And so I'd like to give every one of you this book and it will explain things. Plus, we've got people that will pray with you if you have any questions. If you just want to have somebody pray with you until you start speaking in tongues fluently, they're here to help you. And so uh, we want to be a blessing to you. Robert over here is a man standing with his Bible up. And we've got a prayer room right over here. And if you would just follow Robert, we would like to give every one of you a book and make sure that you understand what's happening to you tonight. So just follow Robert. It'll only take a minute. And we want every one of you to get the full benefit of what happened. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. You know, these are our prayer ministers down here. And I know that there's people that came from a long way. There's people that came believing God for a miracle. And again, the Word of God is the number one thing that I have to communicate. But we do believe that these signs will follow them that believe. And we see miracles happen all of the time. And so we've got these prayer ministers here to help us pray. And I know that there's some people that think I'm the only one that can pray, but it isn't so. Amen. These people can pray. Al and Angie Burke here are from Florida, and uh, they travel with us quite a bit. Both of them have been receiving great miracles. Many of these are our Bible college students, and uh, they've all been through a training, and we are here to bless you and to help you. So if you need prayer for anything, I'd like to give you an invitation right now to come forward and let one of these prayer ministers lay hands on you and agree with you. We also have people standing at the aisles and they're going to direct you towards one of these prayer ministers so that everybody won't just stand over on one side. So please cooperate with them. But if you need prayer for anything, I want to give you an opportunity to come right now and let one of our prayer ministers pray with you. And we're going to believe God for miracles. Amen. So if that's you, come forward. The rest of you, I'm going to release you here in just a minute. But remember that we have CDs and DVDs of tonight's uh, message already duplicated out there. They are available to you. And then we have got all of those books. We've got the Army, the Association of Related Ministries International. We've got the Continuing Education for Ministers. And uh, we've got uh, all kinds of things out there, so please take advantage of it. If you need prayer, come and let one of our prayer ministers agree with you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, we just agree and we believe for all of these people right now that you heal everyone. By your stripes, they've already been healed. And tonight we see every single sickness and disease healed. All of this stuff gone. We believe you've already done your part and we receive these miracles right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We agree and we receive.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. This teaching series is continued on the next DVD in this album. We pray.
笑。